My next certainly knows her way around education policy. Dr. Charmaine Yost is vice president at the Heritage Foundation, where she landed after her time in the Donald Trump administration over at the Health and Human Services. She's a familiar face at FRC, where she served twice. Most recently, as our vice president of communications, her first tour of duty here included a thoughtful study of, guess what? The child care issue, which culminated in her book, Mother in the Middle. Charmaine is a mom of five herself, and if that isn't enough experience, her doctorate at UVA was on parental leave, which is a key feature of the Biden plan. Charmaine, welcome to Pray, Vote, Stand, and thanks for being with us. Oh, Tony, this is a lot of fun. It feels like coming home. Good to see you. Well, I thank you for joining us, and, and it, you know, it's like deja vu. I mean, you were back working on this. You know, the this was a big push of Hillary Clinton. Um, all eyes were on it. You know, it's like they discovered something new, but it's not new. Right, exactly. You know, it's really troubling. I, You and I know across the board on a whole host of issues that the left is trying to use the pandemic to ram through their wish list of favorite liberal leftist programs. And that's exactly what's going on with the education uh, proposals. One of the things that's particularly troubling, not getting enough attention, is that the amount of money that they're asking for, Tony, right now amounts to 10 times the annual budget of the existing budget of the Department of Education. It, this is what, this is defines the meaning of boondoggle. They're just using this crisis time to really get more money and more funding, more permanent long-term funding for their wish list. And, and what that does when you use these huge numbers, you know, we're talking over $6 trillion in programs that he's been promoting just in the first three months people's eyes begin to glaze over. And before you know it, we're into tens and 15 and $20 trillion and nobody thinks about it. Right, exactly. You know, the problem is they haven't even spent the money that they appropriated in the first coronavirus bill. And yet now he's coming back and he's larding up this so-called American Families Plan. You know, Tony, I think it's important for your listeners to know some of the data about this. You know, back in 1964, when Lyndon Johnson first uh, started, inaugurated the Great Society, he said that he was going to use education to eradicate child poverty. And then there became this massive expansion in federal involvement in education. We've since then spent over $2 trillion on K through 12 education. And you know what's happened to the achievement in, um, levels? If you look at all of the data, all of the different metrics, it looks like this. It's been completely flat. You would think with that kind of spending, we would actually see some results for American kids. There is one metric though that has skyrocketed and you wanna know what that is? It won't surprise you at all. It is the amount of spending being done for administrators, for school administrators. So we're spending a lot of money and it's not getting to kids. And I'm here to tell you that's exactly the same pattern we're going to see with this new spending that they want to do. You know, I mentioned uh, Hillary Clinton and, you know, her saying is it, it takes a village, uh, what she was promoting back uh, in the, the 90s. Um, I've got a clip of Joe Biden talking about this because he's not far away from the village. Here's what the president had to say. I often said that children are the kite strings that keep our national ambitions aloft. We say all those kids, well, they're all our children. They're all our children. Um, there are children. They're my children. They're not yours. You know, it's really troubling whenever you hear things like that. And it's like they're they're so close to the truth. Like you and I, we deeply believe in the extended family and the importance of community, um, that that's the bedrock of American community. But what he's getting at there is kind of this communal authority. Authority and the idea that somehow they get to make decisions about American kids. And this is why we keep coming back to saying, if you really want to see an improvement in educational attainment and achievement for kids, you're going to empower parents to be making decisions about 
where and how their kids are getting education. You know, I think it's particularly interesting, but also deeply troubling when you look at the fact that across this country, most public schools have been closed over the last year, but private schools have largely been open. And Tony, what's concerning about that is you're seeing parents vote with their feet, right? They wanted their kids to be able to um, be in school and to be getting direct education. And we're going to be seeing an, an increase in the gap between um, kids who are able to be in school and kids who are not. And it it's really does come down to empowering parents to make decisions for their own kids. Charmaine, let me ask you the question uh, about how this differs from Head Start. I mean, we had, during the Obama administration, they looked back on nearly five decades of Head Start and said it was a failure. So how does this differ? You know, Tony, I am so glad you asked about that because this is something that really is very, very troubling when you hear the left talking about their plans for ex expanding K through 12 education and doing universal uh, pre-K. And they talk about, and it's really, really uh, questionable when they say that the research shows that it, it helps kids. In actual fact, the research that they're citing has been debunked. It's never been able to be replicated. It was the, the one study that they cite was uh, a very small study and it was very uh, in, a, in a very specific kind of environment. They've never been able to replicate it. They haven't been able to scale it. And yet they're taking that and extrapolating it and saying they're going to do it on a mass scale for American kids. You and I both know that is not the way to go. And in fact, it's not really what American parents are saying that they want. You, you heard from uh, mothers earlier in the program about how much American women um, want to be with their kids. When you, when you look at the polling data, um, talking to American women, even American women who are employed full time, they, re they reply that they're looking for flexibility and more options in the workplace. And that's not by expanding uh, paid family leave, by expanding uh, K through 12 into uh, full-time uh, 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 preschool for, for every American child. That's not increasing flexibility. It is going with government decisions about what's best for American parents instead of enabling them to make their own decisions. There are two uh, many outcomes we can measure, but two in particular that I, I think you've looked at in the past and I want you to comment on, I mean, you, you've touched on the, the, the bonding, the relationship between parent and child and how important that is and how it'll be deprived. I mean, we, we talked earlier about the, the worldview of children being formulated uh, between really 15 months uh, and almost completed by the age of 13. I mean, we're basically farming out kids if we go along with this government plan that entire time. But let's talk about the outcomes. The president says we need to add four more years of education to our kids to be competitive internationally, two on the front end, two on the back end. I would ask the question, you know, what have they done with the 12 years that they've had? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, let's underscore the point. You referenced this briefly earlier, so let me bring bring it back and put a fine point on it. They don't have any research to show that expanding to universal pre-K is going to get the outcomes that they want. And in fact, you mentioned this, there is some evidence to show that it can be very negative. And this doesn't surprise us at all when we know about the data about how important it is for kids to get one-on-one -on -one time with their parents. And so I'm, I'm very troubled for them to be so loose and fast with the data and to be inaccurately representing it in order to push through their own agenda. So that's very troubling. And going to your point about, you know, when we're not seeing any kind of improvement in, um, in, in any of the metrics for how the, the current public school system is doing, why we should expand their, uh, expand their reach is, is there's just not a case for it. Uh, unless, of course, we prefer that our children be indoctrinated at a younger age. Well, um, that's another problem that I think that it is really kind of interesting with so many parents now having us having the ability to have their kids right in the next room and they're able to listen to what kind of instruction they're getting. We're really troubled by the reports that we're getting of, of 
teachers trying to purposefully hide curriculum from their from parents. You know, here's the thing, Tony. We we like to talk about lots of different options, uh, whether it's private school or homeschool uh, for American kids, and we think American parents need more choice. But at the end of the day, over 90% of American kids are still in the public school system, and we absolutely have to insist on transparency so that American yes. parents know what it is that their kids are being taught. And after this past year of American parents getting to hear it and see it more close at home, they're, they're really troubled. And particularly when they're getting pushback from their public schools, when they want to have more information about what it is their kids are being, te being taught. So Charmaine Yo's final question for you, given all of that, what should parents be doing right now? Well, they need to be be really being in touch with their school system. We have been talking a lot about encouraging parents to get on their school board, get involved, um, and and really um, exercise your voice. We had a situation here nearby where I live in Northern Virginia, where there was this uh, uh, survey sent out about uh, anti-racism training, and parents um, were very troubled by the nature of some of the questions and started pushing back and asking questions and come to find out some of the parents got a response saying well the school board hadn't actually seen that before it went out this is the kind of thing that parents by being involved paying attention speaking up and and taking ownership of this can really make a difference at the local level by uh, uh, by using their voice and and expressing their opinions about what it is they want their kids to be taught they certainly can, and that is uh, great advice, Charmaine Yost. Thank you so much, Charmaine, for being generous with your time and joining us tonight, and uh, as always, great Thank to you. see you. Thanks, Tony.